So today we're going to talk about some principles and types. And what I mean is principles for how we find Jesus in the Old Testament. But we're also going to look at specific one specific example, which is Adam and Christ. We're going to focus on that example and how we can learn from it. Because Adam is, it turns out, a, is a picture of Christ in the Old Testament. But also, think about this. Think about the heaviness of this. He's a real guy. And God used this real person to be a real-life 3D living image that we could look at and see some contrast and some comparisons to Jesus. That God actually, throughout the scriptures, uses people to tell the story of who Christ is. This is like a next level God's glory in our lives, when you think about it. He's using people to represent who he is. So today we're going to give uh, an example of a specific type in the Old Testament and the New Testament that's, that the Bible says this is a representation. Here, this isn't, we're not fabricating this. We're not finding it on our own even. God's like saying, look, this is, this is clearly in the text. Now, the reason why I'm going to do this, let me explain my, my, my thought process here. Originally, what I was going to do was I was going to walk you guys through a bunch of principles on how we find types in the Old Testament. And this was going to take a few weeks to do just principles, a whole bunch of them, lay out all the rules and answer all the questions about how we find types of Jesus in the Old Testament. Then we were going to go into the Old Testament and start looking for these types. But I've learned something doing youth ministry that I'll share with you (laughs) right now. And that is sometimes um, it's hard to learn all the rules of a game before you're playing the game. And what happens is you, you, we, we would sit down with the kids and we, we'd read all the rules for some game. And by the time you finish reading the rules, you go to play the game and no one has any idea. I don't know. So I frequently will interrupt whatever leaders like explaining the rules and go, let's just start playing. And explain it as we play. And I found that this is a more effective way of teaching a game to people is to explain it while they're playing it rather than before they play. And this is, see what I want to do is apply this to what we're doing here. Not because it's not, a, it's not that it's a game, but there is the sort of mathematical side of it, and then there's the very simple application side. So we're going to do both at the same time. What we're going to do over the next several weeks, assuming that this seems to work well with you guys, is um, we're going to take one or more types that are in the Bible, we're going to look at them, and then we're going to conclude after looking at them with, and what principles now have we learned, so that we can apply that when we're looking for other things in the Old Testament. So we're going to play the game while we learn the game. Does that make sense? I think it'll be more interesting. I think you'll find it to be slightly less boring uh, for, for just, you know, the flesh is weak, and just for the, our ability to stay focused and pay attention. So today, we're going to give you one type, and that's going to be Adam and Christ, how Adam represents Christ. And we're going to look at this from several different scriptures, and then we'll draw principles out as we go. So here, let's get started. Genesis 1.26. Genesis 1.26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so the the appearance of Adam first on, you know, in Genesis, Old Testament, we're we're noticing a few things, right? Adam's made, uh, Adam and Eve, right? But but we'll talk about Adam because he's highlighted later. Made in the image of God and then told to fill the earth, right? To repopulate or to actually populate the earth and then also told to have dominion or authority over all this stuff on the earth. So those are some of the elements that we've noticed. Then in Genesis 3, things go wrong. And after Adam and Eve eat of the fruit in Genesis 3, 17, we have this. It says, and to Adam, he said, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So we have these sort of two big moments in Adam's life, right? The creation, his commission, and then the fall. And... um, What the New Testament does, and go ahead and turn to Romans 5, is the New Testament takes Adam and relates him to Jesus very specifically. 
And this is a great place for us to start in our study of types of Christ in the Old Testament or how to find Jesus in the Old Testament because this is where God's telling you, here's how you find Jesus. You know, like here he is. He is, he is right here in Adam. And um, let's read here, Romans 5, 12. Here's the comparison. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that would be Adam, and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted when there is, where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. And, and here we get actually the New Testament using the terminology type. This is where we get it. When we say a type of Christ, we actually get that right out of the text itself. Adam is a type of him who is to come. This is like a, a mirror image, a reflection, so to speak, or, or the idea of like a ring where the ring has a seal and you press the seal in and you've got the two things that correspond to each other. Um, so Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But then it starts in verse 15 to draw some of the ways that Adam is, is like Jesus, but also ways that Adam is like the opposite of Jesus. And I think that the way Adam represents Christ becomes kind of a roadmap for how we apply typology to other characters in the Bible. So here, verse 15, it says, But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. Notice how he's repeatedly referred to Adam as one man, and he refers to Jesus as one man. Just notice the correlation there. Verse 16, and the free gift is not like the result of the one man's, that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. So we see that there's these points of comparison. Let's kind of recap. Um, Adam represented everyone. He represents all of us. All sin, all die. In Adam, we, we all fall to the same fate. And Christ, therefore, stands to represent all of us. Now, this isn't universalism. And some people would actually try to use this passage to teach universalism, but that's not, not what's in view, clearly, as you read the rest of Romans and read through the scriptures. But it is saying that as Adam is sort of like this figurehead to represent all humankind and the decision he made set the fate for all of us, so Jesus then becomes the next figurehead for all of us. And in Christ, I have the opposite fate. Um, sin entered through Adam. That's what entered through Adam, according to Romans. And, and uh, righteousness entered through Jesus. So this, these are like opposites, right? This is more like a, a, an inversion image. You know when, you, when you, 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 you switch the black and whites on a picture? And you get that inverted image. In some ways, Adam is like an inverted or reversed image of Jesus. Yeah, he, in some ways he's the same. Adam represented all of us. Jesus came to represent all of us. In some ways, he's the opposite. Adam brought sin. Jesus brought righteousness. Death came through Adam. Life came through Jesus. This is just what Romans 5 lays out. Death, one came, uh, brought death, one brought life. Uh, condemnation came through Adam, specifically condemnation. But justification came through Jesus. Many were made sinners through Adam, but many were made righteous through Jesus. And so here's the principle. Let me pause for a second. What principle are we learning here? As we look at typology in the Old Testament, is that it's very much a compare and contrast thing. When I was in school, we used to get these assignments, right? In like social studies. And they'd say at the end of the chapter, compare and contrast, dot, dot, dot. And it would tell you what to compare and contrast. Compare and contrast the, the process by which the bills are something ratified by the who's the what's it's. And I always struggled with this because I was like, Compare and contrast. I didn't, I honestly, for, for years, I did not understand that compare meant how are they alike and contrast meant how are they different. But that's what we're getting here. That's like the principle we can apply to typology. 
is we go to the Old Testament and we find a type or picture of Christ, ask two questions. How are they alike? And how are they different? Because you will see this repeatedly with the types that the Bible gives us. In some ways they are alike, but there are important ways they are different, and the differences are part of the typology. So Adam, figurehead for all of us, Jesus, figurehead for all of us, compare. But then there's the contrast part. Adam brought death, Jesus brought life. Adam brought sin, Jesus brought righteousness. Adam brought condemnation, Jesus brought justification. Because it turns out that Jesus is better. <laughs> Jesus is better than all of the types that represent him, and that's actually important. Hebrews 1 will eventually get there, but it actually drives home this thing over and over again the book of Hebrews, that Jesus is greater than the priest, greater than the prophet, greater than the angels, greater than fill in the blank. Um, he's, he's greater than all of these things. So there's the part of the contrast that's there. Um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. There's another passage that relates to this as well. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 45. This is another one of those Adam represents Jesus passages. It says, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust, Adam, right? The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just And here's the application. He's going to apply that for us. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So speaking of the image that Adam was, was, was made in, he was made in God's image, except he was of dust. Before he even had kids, he was consigned to stay dust and die as dust. And we we're born and we get some dusty experiences of our own. But Jesus, he comes and gives us that fullness of life, the, the greater one, the greater Adam, the, the, the last Adam. In Genesis 126, we have some more correlations, because there's a lot, actually, between Adam and Jesus, uh, and I'll point out a bunch of it. And there's more than I'll get into tonight. Uh, that would be for your own self to discover. I really do believe there's more here. So in Genesis 126, Adam is made in God's likeness, in his image, right? But, but in Hebrews 1.3, I believe we get a case that Jesus is that, but more so. And here's the typology. Jesus being greater than the Old Testament type that corresponds to him. So Hebrews 1.3 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature and upholds the universe by the word of his power. So it's like way beyond Adam and his representation of God being in the image. Jesus comes. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. So mankind was made in God's image. Jesus is the image. You know, Adam was made in the image, and then it was then these things were marred somehow, and we, we now bear the image of Adam, so to speak. Not just I mean we're in God's image still, but there's like this taintedness to it, and we die. But Christ comes, and then we will bear in his image. He's restoring the thing that Adam lost. Adam was commanded in Genesis 126 also, uh, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So Adam was told to have dominion, but that dominion was somehow damaged. After judgment came in Genesis 3, he's like, yeah, you know, the ground's not going to yield to you. And there's basically going to be these problems in you accomplishing the task of dominion. Jesus, in a greater sense, has dominion. In Ephesians 1.20, it says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Philippians 2.10 speaks of this dominion of Christ as well. And it says, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So Adam's dominion is like limited to this earthly realm. And even that's kind of marred. Jesus comes, his dominion is unlimited. And then, of course, we come into Christ and we actually share in that dominion. We're co-heirs with Christ. 
So do you, do you see how what Adam failed at or partially represented, Christ comes and fulfills and is the full representation of? Adam was told to be fruitful and multiply. To be fruitful and multiply. This was not about mathematics. This is, this is, this is about procreation, right? Fill the earth and be fruitful. And Christ, he does so, but in a far greater way. In a far greater way. In Romans 8, 16 and 17, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also, or yeah, we may also be glorified with him. So we have this whole idea of being children and the idea of being co-heirs with Christ, kind of both of these things. And just in Genesis 1.26, Adam was told both of those qualities. Be fruitful, multiply, and, to, and have dominion. And that's what Jesus ultimately accomplished in a far greater and far more expansive way. But there's a whole other side to the Adam and Christ typology that God has placed, in, in not only in reality, but also in the text of Scripture. So Ephesians 5.22 Husbands, wives, we know this passage. Hopefully we know it really well. We have to keep reminding ourselves of this if we're going to honor God in our marriage. And Ephesians 5.22, we find another layer of this, and it has to do with Adam and Eve and Christ in the church and the picture of, of that. So it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of, the, of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, quoting Genesis. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Do you see what he says here? He quotes Genesis and he goes, this mystery of two becoming one, he goes, it's profound. And I'm telling you what it's about. It's about Jesus and the church. Husband and wife are designed to be a type representing Jesus and church, Christ and the church. This was part of the original plan. When God did this thing with Adam and Eve, and then when he had it written and recorded for all time, he did it to be an embedded message about Jesus and the church for all time. So let's, let's look at this. Let's go to Genesis 2, and we'll look at the story here about Eve and Adam and how they represent Christ in the church. Now, that, now, here's a principle for you. When the New Testament clearly identifies a type like Christ in the church, Adam and Eve, then I think it's fair for us to go into the text and go, I wonder what else is there. You know, I mean, that, that, that seems legitimate to me. God is saying, hey, this is a profound mystery, but guess, it's about Jesus and the church. So let's go to the text now, and now I'm going to do something. I'm going to take a little bit of, I wouldn't call it liberty, like I'm breaking rules or something like that. Rather, I, I feel like I'm obeying rules of biblical interpretation, and I'm saying, let's look at how Adam and Eve represent Christ and the church. So Genesis 2, verse 18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. The, um, the King James Version says, help me. I called Allison that one time and she was like, what? What, she just, what does that even mean? I just thought I was calling her some kind of like side of beef or something like that. <laughs> um, so, so I didn't call her that any, anymore. Um, so I'll make a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of, heavens, of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he, uh, while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up in its place with flesh. Closed up its place with flesh, excuse me. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last 
is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So let's draw out some of the some of the things. There's actually probably more here than what I'm going to give you tonight. I, and I'd encourage you to look for it for yourself without being, don't make stuff up. Look to find what's actually there, right? So let's look at the points that are, that are in the passage because that's the principle we're learning here is that Adam, there were these specific points. Adam brought condemnation. Adam represented all people. Adam brought sin and death. Adam was of the dust. Jesus is a comparison and a contrast of all of those points. So we look at the points in the text and try to find the relation to Christ. So in verse 18, Adam's going to have a helper fit for him. And the truth is, as God, God looks down at creation and sees fallen mankind, there is no one fit for him. We're not fit for him. We're unfit. I don't belong in heaven. This sinner, this wicked man, I don't belong. He has to do something to me to make me fit for him. And so then in verses 19 and 20, um, we see that Eve is not made like the rest of creation. Right? Adam's formed of the dust. Right? God then forms all of the creatures and brings them to Adam. But Eve is not made like this at all. Eve is made how? Eve is made from Adam, like literally Adam's substance taken from his own body created Eve. That's how Eve was made. And this is, I think, a picture of the church. We are made from Jesus. We are made from him. I'm not made like the rest of creation. Uh, We, as as Christians, we're not only in the image of God, but being born again in Christ and made into a a new person, we are the body of Christ. Do you see the connection between us being his body and Eve being made from Adam's body? 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, Therefore, if any, anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And so we've, we've been made a helper fit for him through that. The way that he was made was Adam was given, put into a deep sleep, which you might not think is that significant until you realize it's connected to Jesus somehow. How, how is it that we were made? Christ was put to death for us. And sleep is a euphemism for death throughout the Bible. Jesus himself used this. When Lazarus died, he goes, he's sleeping. Right? Then Paul talks about those who've fallen asleep in Christ. So this euphemism is there. I'm not saying Adam actually died, but I do think the picture is being drawn to represent Christ as being sort of the exaggerated thing of whatever we see Adam doing, you know. And, um, and Adam, he's put to this deep sleep. Christ, he actually did die for us. The rib is interesting. Um, there, there did go around uh, for a while, I don't know if it's still in any circles, the idea that men have one less rib than women because Adam had one of his ribs removed in order to make Eve. And I, I don't know if that's, like, is that how the real world, real world works? Like if someone removes your rib, your kids are born with one less rib? Is that how it works? Because we're all in trouble, especially if your dad was like a shop teacher, you're going to be missing fingers. But... <laughs> Um, but actually the word there probably, it, it may well have been, it, it has to do with like something like the, the cage or the structure of something, the word that's used in the Hebrew there for rib. So it may well have been the actual rib bone, but it seems like it was more than just that. Because Adam says, she's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. So it seems like there's just like a whole chunk. And Adam, that's then missing from Adam. He's, he's literally for the rest of his life scarred to make Eve. A wound in his side to make Eve. We we were made from the wounds of Christ as the church. By his stripes we are healed. I mean, he was pierced for us. And he was pierced where? In the side. And those wounds may be the only wounds you ever see on anyone in heaven. Jesus, after his resurrection, still bore the marks of his wounds. He tells Thomas, touch me here. Put your hand in my side. Put your, put your finger in the holes in my hands. Why? Because it's just like with Adam, it's like literally the only thing in creation at that point that had any wounds of any kind. And I think this is to picture Christ. So he was missing something, and guess what? She had the thing he was missing. <laughs> He said, she's bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. We are made from the donation of Christ's flesh. 
That's what the scripture teaches us. Ephesians 5, 28 through 30, it says, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. And you see, Eve was, was made of his body. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. And you see the connection, like the light bulbs go on, like we're his flesh. And not in the carnal sense, no, in the sense of we're his body. We're his, he made us his body and now loves us. That was how God would make a helper fit for him. If I'm going to make someone to fit Adam, it'll have to be made from Adam. If I'm going to make someone to fit Jesus, to fit Christ, I'll have to make them from me. Wow. In verse 24 of Genesis 2, she's taken uh, from him and then, so she's bone of his bones, right? But then they're married and there's this synergy between the ideas. She's taken from his side. She's bone of his bones, flesh of his flesh. And then when they get married, the two become what? They become one again. So there's this like idea where Eve is taken from him and then they're rejoined in marriage. They're rejoined in marriage. And so we too, when, we're, when we are born again in Christ, we're made from him, right? We're not, the same, we're not him, right? We're made, but we're made from him of his donation, of his, of his sacrifice. We become his body. But then there's a time coming in the future where the oneness we have with Christ goes beyond. Because while we are the bride of Christ, we are yet betrothed, so to speak. And there is the marriage supper of the Lamb coming. And our future eternity in Christ, the, the oneness that's coming, is way beyond uh, anything that we've experienced in this life. Husband and wife experience a taste of this, but with Christ, it's far beyond. It's much more. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 talks about this. It says, um, do you not know, I'm sorry, verse 15 through 17 of 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who's joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. So Eve experiences a physical oneness with Adam, but we experience a spiritual oneness with Christ. And that becomes elevated in the future that we may be one with him in a greater sense. And that's in Revelation, Revelation 19, verses 7 through 9, the great marriage, the, the, the wonderful marriage that all other marriages are meant to be a picture of. It says, let us, Revelation 19, 7, let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. So we see, taken from him and then united to him in marriage, and this is the same thing with our relationship with Christ. Born again in Christ, a new creation in him, made from him, and then united together, one in spirit with him. And then at the end of Genesis 2, we get this interesting phrase, which, which here's another principle I'll give you. <laughs> and we'll talk more about this over the next weeks. But when you read a passage in the Old Testament and you go, wait, what? Oftentimes, it's as though that is the clue that there's something in there for us. And we read about this with like the bronze serpent or Moses striking the rock. We read about this with, you go, huh, what? And so often, those are the things where there's a, there's a picture of Christ for us. So... In, a, in a, sorry, Genesis 2.26, it says that they were naked and unashamed. Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. And there's, this was a reality. I'm not just allegorizing these things. This was, this was the, the way it really was. But how does it picture Christ in the church? When you're, the idea of being naked and unashamed is I'm, I'm exposed. You see all of what I am, and yet there's nothing to be ashamed of. And this is how the Bible describes us in Christ. It says in Ephesians 5.26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Meaning that in Christ, this blows my mind, I am not only forgiven, I am relieved of my shame. And that's not the same thing as being forgiven exactly is it there's more to it than that i'm relieved of my shame in christ and yes this comes in in our future presentation to him 
that I'm positionally forgiven in him, but yet I, I feel as though my shame keeps returning periodically in this life as I fail, as I, as I blow it, as I go into the flesh. And yet there is a time coming where there will be no more flesh. We'll be able to get along, you guys, really well. Even better, I mean, actually most of us get along pretty well, right now, at least as far as I know. Maybe, maybe some of you guys got things going on I don't know about, but as far as I know, we get along pretty well. But, but there'll be, could you imagine the fellowship when our flesh is no longer in the way? No envy, no jealousy, no pride, no weird anxieties created by the awareness of personal failings and things like that. Like, unashamed. And that's, that's how they're presented to each other. And that is how the bride will be presented to Christ. Unashamed. Wow. So, um, so okay, there's, there's just some pictures of, of Adam and Christ. I really believe there is more there. And if you study the passage on your own, you may find more there. I caution you to make sure that you do what I'm trying to do here, which is you find actually specific points in the text that can be drawn out reasonably, reasonably inferred to be types of Christ or, or representations of the relationship between Christ and, and us. Um, but let's talk now about a couple principles, because there's one I want to cover in particular. Somebody might say, Mike, what you're doing when you go to the Old Testament and you interpret it this way is you're violating one of the golden rules of hermeneutics. Now, raise your hand if you've heard the term hermeneutics before. Okay, good. You, you look how smart you guys are. like almost everybody. Um, so hermeneutics is defined in short, right? It's the art and science of biblical interpretation. That's, that's, that's what it is. That's the, the terminology for it. it. The term is applied to other things too that aren't related to the Bible. Hermeneutics can be applied to a lot of things, but specifically in the world of theology, it's the art and science of studying the Bible. And there's rules for interpretation. In fact, probably the most, the most important rule in the world is context, right? Context, context, context. Context is king. This is what cults and, and skeptics often forget as I hear them try to quote the Bible to attack the Bible. And it's like, you, you just think like, did you even read the passage like before? Because like it's my job as a pastor. I may even teach a topical study, right? But I better study verse by verse, even to prepare for a topical message. You got to context is king. Well, there's a couple other rules of hermeneutics that are pretty well generally accepted, and some may think that what we're doing here violates those rules. So let's talk about those. One of those rules is authorial intent. What did the author intend when he wrote this thing? And the other is the original audience. The original audience. What did the original audience take this to mean? Because if you take it to mean something the original audience didn't take it to mean, then maybe you're making stuff up. You know, that's the idea. And these are generally good rules to have, sort of. But obviously, I'm violating that. I mean, I don't think that when Moses wrote Genesis, he was thinking to himself, this is a picture of Christ in the church. I don't think he understood that much about Christ. I think he understood something, but I don't think he understood that much about Christ to where he could know what was being written here. Um, so we have the, the original author issue there, and then we have the original audience. There's no way the ancient Israelites were thinking like, yes, yes, the, the Jewish and Gentile gathered together in, in, in Messiah are, are what are pictured here with Adam and Eve, and he's being put to sleep, and that represents the death of Messiah and how he comes back. To, you know, this is like... Not probably what they would get out of the text. So how can, I, how can I justify what I'm doing without violating rules of hermeneutics? Well, I think it's easy, but I think we have to talk about it because um, this, is the, this is the techie stuff. The, <laughs> the, the technical side of this you know, typology stuff. So when it comes to authorial intent, we'll talk about that first, then I'll talk about the original audience. Um, I fully agree that you, you cannot ask the text to mean more than it meant by the original author. But if you're going to study the Bible, you have to acknowledge that the original author is not just the human author. God inspired the text of scripture. And to think that what God intends in the text has to be limited by what the author humanly understood is just silly. I mean, it's an artificial limitation placed upon the text. If God's inspiring it, then obviously he has intents that go beyond the knowledge of the original author. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to inspire anything. The author could just write whatever they want, <laughs> and there you go. The nature of inspiration is that there seems to be more to the text than what was necessarily known by the original author. But not only that, we can, we can support this in Scripture. So uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 is one of the classic passages about the inspiration of the Bible. 
It says all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, and it goes on. But the, the important principle here is the scripture is from God. It's breathed out by God. Then we have this passage in 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. This is another probably less often quoted passage, but it really applies. Oddly enough, this passage is frequently mis- misapplied, I think. Um, so 1 Peter 1, 20, it says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What the main point of 1 Peter 1, uh, 2 Peter, sorry, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, the main point of this is to say that the scripture is not limited, nor is it directed by the mere human understanding of either the author or the reader. It's from God, right? It's from God. It's not of your private interpretation. To limit our understanding to the author or to limit our understanding to the reader of a particular moment and say that's all there is to it is to violate what Second Peter says. It was never produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now let me give you an example of this in the Old Testament. Uh, Daniel 12. We're going to actually read the entire chapter of Daniel 12. So Daniel 12, 13 verses we'll read through here. And this is, I'll give you the short summary so you know what we're getting into. This is where Daniel's like, okay, I've just had a lot of like visions and stuff and all kinds of stuff is happening. And he's going, what does this mean? And I like how the response he gets helps us answer our question. Can the text mean more than it meant to the original guy that wrote it down? Um, So here, Daniel 12, verse one, it says, and I won't get into explaining the prophecy here because we're looking at how it's interpreted is the question. Um, At the time... At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as has never, um, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose names shall be found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who. T- Uh, And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Things will make more sense then. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and, and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, Uh, who is above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time and times, time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. Now, verse eight, after you, like Daniel, you probably feel like he does in verse eight. He says, I heard, but I did not understand. <laughs> Perhaps you feel that way if you haven't studied this passage carefully. Is it, then I said, oh my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Implying that the phrase shut up and sealed means you don't understand it. It's for a future generation. They'll get it, Daniel. It doesn't apply to you. Interesting, huh? So go your way. The words are shut up and sealed for the time, until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and be refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall, future tense, understand. And from, that, and from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolation is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. Now, Jesus, when he was on the earth, he actually referenced this abomination of desolation as a future event. While he was walking there, he's like, yes, well, when you see that, then you have run out of Jerusalem, it's, things are coming. So this is like this, this time where Daniel's the author, he's writing the text and he goes, I don't know what it means. And it's not, even, it's not for me. I'm the author, but because God is the ultimate inspirer of the text, I'm just going to write what he tells me to write, and we'll see what happens. Um, The original audience is not intended to understand this text either. They're intended to carry it forward for a future generation because they'll need it when the time comes. 
So if we're to artificially say that we can only ask Daniel 12 to mean what it meant to Daniel, and we can only allow it to be interpreted in ways it was understood by the original audience who first heard it, we're actually violating Daniel 12 because it implies that neither of those things are true. He didn't understand it. They didn't understand it. So when I say, um, you know, there's a type of Christ in the Old Testament that perhaps Moses wouldn't have understood, this is entirely consistent with biblical hermeneutics, with, with studying the text of Scripture. God inspired it, and he had intended from the beginning for it to have meanings that might be unfolded later. Um, so then there's the idea of the original audience. The original audience is important, and the ori original audience should, um, should interest us. I do care what, it's, what it meant to the original audience, but I'm not going to limit it as though that's all there is. And so that, that's the task of, of hermeneutics. I do ask what did it mean to the original audience, but I do not say that's all it could ever mean for all time because God intended it to be written for more than the original audience um, because of his inspiration. So let me give an example of this. In Galatians 3.8, in Galatians 3.8 it says, And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So the scripture foresaw something. <laughs> like, isn't that interesting? The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, did what? Preach the gospel to Abraham? And what, what phrase is this that, preached the, that Abraham heard the gospel? When God says, Abraham, in you all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, did Abraham go? That is clearly the gospel message of salvation by faith alone through Christ that will be available to all the world. Or did Abraham just have like a piece of that and the rest of it made more sense as the story continued to unfold? Yeah, he just had a piece of it and, and it made more sense. And he had faith and he was saved by faith, but he didn't have the whole message yet. Um, so it, it's about us seeing um, what God has put there to find. It's not about us finding something for me that's not even part of the original intent. I can't just open the Bible and find special secret messages for me that God never intended in the first place and call that Bible study. What we're doing as we do this typology thing is we're saying, I'm not creatively finding Jesus. No, I'm discovering what God has planted there all along and intended for me to find all along. And that's consistent with the teaching of Jesus as well. So it's not something new. This is not new theology, so to speak. This is discovering the original intent of the author who inspired, the real inspirer of the scriptures. And that's what makes it so exciting. Because we stand, from the perspective of the book of Revelation looking back, we stand with the full revelation of God's word, we stand with clear indications. Here's a type, here's a type, here's a type. Here's principles you can learn for looking at types and pictures of Christ. So we have more to discover in the Old Testament today than Daniel did, than Moses did. We have more to discover today than the prophets who wrote the text. It's a, it's, it's a book where, what, as, as a Corinthian says, that the veil's taken away in Christ. And you go, oh, like I see it, I see it. Um, first Peter, well, this is the last verse we'll do tonight. First Peter chapter one, verses 10 through 12. This, this talks about the same concept. And now that we're, we're in the mode of thinking of types and typologies and pictures of Christ, this will probably make more sense to you than if you just read it um, without considering those things. So first Peter chapter one, verse 10, it says concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Now, that, that's almost a tongue twister. That's a really thoughtful passage or thoughtful sentence, if I can give a quick summary of it, right? It's like, here's the prophets. They're writing things down going, I wonder what this means. <laughs> what? I mean, I'm writing about the, I'm Isaiah. I'm writing about the sufferings of the Messiah, and I'm going, I know this is the Lord telling me to write this, but I wonder how this will play out. What will this look like? What will this, what will it, how much clarity will I have after the fact is the idea. And then verse 12, it says, it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. Wait, what? The original author was writing something that was for generations later. 
It was revealed to them they were not serving themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look. That it was a mystery revealed, but the point is revealed. So this is very much, as we study the Old Testament from the perspective of Christ, it's like you've got a movie where there's all these little careful plots given through, you know, pieces of the plot given throughout the film, but not revealed of what, you, what they mean isn't revealed until the end of the movie. And you have those movies you have to watch twice. Because the first time you were completely confused, right? And the second time it was like, oh, oh, oh. That's the Bible, right? It's after you see the revelation of Christ, you go back to the scriptures and you go, oh, 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 I get it. Wow. And, and all we looked at really today was just um, a person who represented Christ, Adam, as the figurehead that represented Jesus and his relationship with Eve, representing Christ in the church. Um, there's so many other things we'll look at as we continue. We'll look at not only other people who represent Christ, some that are clearly indicated, like David and guys like that, but also some that aren't, like Jephthah. I think Jephthah is one of the most interesting characters in the book of Judges that is a picture of Christ, even though it's not clearly indicated in the New Testament that he is. I think it's, I think it's obvious as you read the text. Um, I think Solomon is a picture of Christ personally, and we'll get into, and I'll try to justify that to you. And feel free to disagree, and that's I think that's okay. We we should be able to kind of wrestle with this and think it through. But we'll also look at things that aren't people, but that are pictures of Christ, like the temple itself, like the bronze serpent, whom Jesus identified as representing Christ. So there's 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 people, there's um, uh, things, and there's also events like the feasts of Israel, the Passover which Jesus identified as representing Christ. Christ is our Passover, Hebrews says. So the, oh, the light bulb just keeps getting brighter and brighter as we go through the scriptures doing this. So um, I'm excited about it. I hope that this is a good method of doing it. What we'll continue to do over the next several weeks is I'll, I'll bring one or more types of Christ and then we'll try to draw principles out of that. So we're kind of putting in our we're learning the rules as we go, and we're putting into our, into our thinkers <laughs> these principles that will allow us to have more O moments as we read through the Old Testament. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your holy word. Uh, to think that, um, that w- what we read in the New Testament, that, that all of creation in Colossians, it was made not only through Christ, but for Christ. It was made for him. And to apply this to Adam, like Adam was made for Christ, not only to know Jesus, but to to be a representation of a, of a comparison and contrast of Jesus. It just blows our minds. You have created the universe for your glory in more ways than we probably appreciate. Our actual lives, the, the, the flow of history reveals Jesus. It is his story. And uh, it's exciting to learn these things and to, to have the light bulb go on. We pray you'd give us great wisdom, give us solid principles that we could apply as we read the Old Testament so that we would faithfully find what you have always intended for us to find. In Jesus' name, amen.